Okay, Matthew chapter 17, transfiguration. The word there was used as metamorphosis, which is a term you see from the caterpillar changes to a butterfly. Metamorphosis. Amazing the, the change that a caterpillar goes through to become a butterfly in that cocoon. It says it becomes like sludge, and then something happens in a dark place, and it becomes totally changed, transfigured between a caterpillar and a butterfly. We've got to look at a time that Jesus completely changes before the glorified Christ. He becomes a glorified Christ as he was, as he turned up to the Apostle John in Revelations. He gives James, Peter, and John just a sneak peek of it. Jesus was going to look like as a glorified Christ in metamorphosis, a sneak peek of what he was going to look like after the crucifixion, after the resurrection, and the ascension. And you go through this teaching, this passage, and it blows your mind. It leaves you with a sense of wonder. It's difficult to preach and to get a sense of, okay, what are the discipleship principles here? Can we glean for this? It will help us in our daily lives. The context before Matthew chapter 17, Jesus is speaking about His followers. Jesus spoke about His followers will be like the master. The students will be like a teacher. Spoke about this last week, that if ever we go through Jesus expects us to follow, that He was a great leader, a great example, but if He was crucified, if His body was beaten, then we can expect in our life some sort of persecution, some sort of beating, if you like, for being a Christian. It's okay. Jesus went through it first. He's with us in the storm. He's with us through every raised eyebrow, and He's going to go before us and meet us in the storm. Jesus has just spoken to his disciples about laying down their lives. Verse 25 of chapter 16, if you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. This is the first time in Matthew Jesus is teaching about his coming death, that he was going to be crucified. And he starts speaking to his disciples and says, if you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. If you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. If I understand, that's a high call, to give up your life for Jesus. How do you surrender? If it comes first, do we surrender everything that we know to gain this glorified Jesus, or do we encounter the glorified Jesus and then surrender? Well, this is what Jesus is speaking about. What does it benefit you if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? For the Son of Man will come with His angels in the glory of His Father, will judge all people according to their deeds. I tell you the truth. Some standing here right now will not die before the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. I read this commentary that sort of shed some light. The theme is spiritual death. The theme is laying down your life. And you read what Jesus said earlier. It looks as though some of you, it could be saying, some of you are negant and naturally die before you see Christ in His glory. But He's speaking about a death to yourself, a surrendering to yourself. So He could be saying, and you've got to check us out for yourself, I tell you the truth, some standing here right now will not surrender. You will not lay down your life before you see the Son of Man and His kingdom and His glory. So He's saying, some of you will only surrender after you see me as a glorified Christ. After you see me as a resurrected, exalted Christ, then you will surrender. Which fits in for what happens next, because Matthew chapter 17 She's explaining this, look, some of you might only surrender and die for me once you see me in all my glory. Six days later, chapter 17, Jesus took Peter and the two brothers, James and John, led them up a high mountain to be alone. Why? What is the point in this? What's he trying to teach us? We're being alone with Jesus. And sometimes you just need to be alone with Jesus, don't you? So much distractions. 
so much cares and worries in the world, so much stuff to deal with. It's a good thing to be alone with Jesus. It's a good thing to be teen up, to be alone and have personal space with Jesus Christ. As the men watched, Jesus' appearance was transformed. A metamorphosis happened. He teen teen him up. In the other gospel, it says he teen him up to pray. Imagine, like we had a great prayer meeting downstairs last Tuesday. The best I've ever seen at a prayer meeting. It was great. The presence of Jesus was there. The Spirit was flowing. But you imagine being in a, invited into a prayer meeting with Jesus. He says, come on, I want, I want you to see how I interact with the Father. I want you to see how I ask on behalf of the Father, how I intercede for humanity to the Father. I want you to witness the speech, the unity between my will and the Father's will. Imagine being at a prayer meeting with Jesus. As the men watched, Jesus' appearance was transformed. And if you get that picture in Revelations chapter 1, this is what they saw. His face shone like the sun. This wasn't just Jesus becoming brighter. This was a caterpillar becoming a butterfly. This was complete change before their eyes. His clothes became as white as light. Suddenly Moses and Elijah appeared and began talking with Jesus. In another gospel it says they began, Moses and Elijah appeared and began talking to Jesus about his exodus from this world. He started speaking about the cross. Moses and Elijah appeared and started talking to Jesus about the cross. Why Moses and Elijah? Why not Noah and David? Why not Daniel and Samson? Why not Deborah and Gideon? Why, why did Moses? Why did Moses and Elijah turn up to speak about the cross? And could you imagine what they said to Jesus? Come on, keep going. You're doing well. They wouldn't have had to explain. Look, Jesus, you've got to go through a few things that are going to reject you. Jesus knew that he was going to get rejected. Jesus knew that they were going to put him on a cross. Jesus knew his blood would be shed for our humanity. Jesus didn't need a theology lesson. When Moses and Elijah turned up and started speaking about Exodus, and you could imagine the conversation, keep going, Jesus. This is for humanity. You're doing well. Keep going, Jesus. If you could survive 40 days in the desert face to face with the devil himself, tempted, and you've remained strong. This was the moment that Jesus started speaking about his death. He knew six months, this was six months previous to the crucifixion. Jesus knew his time was short. Maybe he just needed some people to turn up that understood what he was gone through because the disciples still never got for he was gone through. Maybe he needed some people to turn up and just say, Come on, Jesus. Do it for humanity. For the joy set before you endured the cross. Because there's going to be a bunch of people in the broch in the year 2022 that's going to need some hope. There's going to be some widows that's going to need some hope. And they're going to need a savior. They're going to need a redeemer. Keep on going, Jesus. But why Moses? Why Elijah? Moses was the man of the book. He wrote the Torah. He wrote the law through divine inspiration, through the Holy Spirit. But Moses is the shining light through the Old Covenant or the book. God gave the law through, through Moses. He instructed a nation through Moses. Moses didn't just know the book. He wrote a lot of the book. It was to be known as the law of Moses. A man of the book turned up. A man that God would call friend. A man that would be invited into an intimate place with Yahweh God. And he got his little apprentice, Joshua, listening on the outside. God knew Moses. Moses knew God. He was a friend, but he was a man 
as a law, the man, the man of the book, Elisha. But does Elisha represent Moses is the man of the book. Elisha was the man, the prophet, the lead prophet that's seen resurrection power, that's seen supplies multiply, that's seen dead people come alive. He was the head prophet. Moses was the man of the book, the written law. Elijah was a heat guy on spiritual things. He was into prophecy. He would tell kings the word of the Lord. Through his mouth, God would cause a drought. God would also cause it to rain through his mouth. Spiritual things, heavenly things. He was a head prophet. And so God sent the man of the book and the man of the spirit to speak to Jesus and usher into a new covenant. Paul exclaimed, Lord, it's wonderful for us to be here. Peter would explain in 1 Peter his interpretation of what happened to him in this mount, and we will get there at the end. It's wonderful for us to be here. If you want, I'll make three shelters as memorials. Another verse that says three tents. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Peter's like the new convert. He sees Jesus in eyes glory. He recognizes him. He recognizes Christ as the exalted king. It's like the sun is, the sun is shining out his face, Jesus' face. Jesus' clothes are changed. They're like bleached wool. People say crazy things in this moment. Peter was the guy that just says for Abdi's feeling. And he didn't want to lose this moment. And he says, Jesus, I want to build for you. I want to build for you a memorial, a tent, so you can be contained. I'll not only build for you, Jesus. I'm going to put you alongside Moses. I'm going to build a tent for him. And we'll build a tent for Elijah. And we've we'll got to stay here. Amazing when you hear it's a new convert experience. I mind when I got saved and you become born again. If ever you, I want to build for Jesus. And you see, Jesus is the glorified Savior. You feel His presence. And sometimes the response is, Jesus, I just want to build for you. I want to build for your kingdom. I want to be a builder. You're like, Jesus, if you want to build me a build an orphanage, I'll build it. And if Moses is what I mean, I'll build in for him. And if uh, Elijah's what I mean, I'll build in for him. Come on, it's a born again experience. But we'll turn around and say, I want to do stuff. Put my own every rot. I want to do it. I'm excited. I want to put my hands to the plow because I owe Jesus service because I recognize him as the anointed one, as the glorified one, the Son of God that came in to the world. And Peter's like, I don't want to lose us. I want to go build. I want to go do stuff. Peter was a fisherman. He was not a builder. I don't care if he could build a shelter even if he wanted to. But this is what Jesus requires of us. Even when he was thinking about building, listen, there was a time for building for Jesus. There was a time for servanthood. There was a time to put our hands to the plow. We're big on that in this church. We serve our community well. There's a time for kids' clubs. There's a time for youth clubs. There's a time to build special moments for Jesus. Peter was on the mount. The first reaction he got, I want to build for you, Jesus. Well, look at what happens. Even as he spoke about building, about strategizing, about getting stuff done, a bright cloud overshadowed them. This was the first time the Shekinah glory was mentioned in the Word of God for 700 years. The glory overshadowed them. This was Peter just wanting to build. And Jesus says, be quiet. I really want you to be overshadowed by my glory. Peter, I don't want you to miss this moment. I want you just to feel that anointing, the presence. I want you to fall in love with Yahweh, this holy 
God, the presence of Christ comes, I would say, to every non-believer, new believer, get to Kenfe is to be overshadowed by Jesus. Before you think about saving the world and building loads of stuff, Kenfe is to rest under the shadow of the Almighty. To position yourselves under the feathers of His wings like a little hen, a little chicken, a little child. Kenfe is to go into your room and say, Come, Lord Jesus, come, bar none. Kenfe is to come under the presence, the divine presence of Jesus. Jesus didn't say to Peter, On you go, chief, bow for me. This wasn't then. There'd be a time that Peter, be a time that Peter, people would get healed for people's shadows. And at the point, Pentecostals say, Amen. People will never be healed for your shadow for you can face to come under his shadow. Your priority should always be, I want to come under your shadow. Do you can that you only come under a shadow of something that's bigger than you? Like I kind of cast a shadow of a, a building. I'm too smart. I can cast a shadow, the sun's shining, no, the sun, the light's shining here, and if something was there, just a little ant or something was on the stage, would be casting my shadow, or the ant, it would have been a clue if it was happening just now. It's only something bigger than you it would be cast a shadow, and you become smart. Church, how important is it just to experience the glory and the presence of Jesus? As we meet and as we gather, you've got to leave here, or maybe hold your hostage for, or maybe I could squeeze another half an hour out of this. How important is it for you to have moments of just come where Jesus come? want to be overshadowed in your presence. There's time for activity. There's time for church activity. Jesus believes in mission. He's a go God. He gives us a glimpse if it happens with a glorified risen Savior to say, hey, at the start, when you can for it is to bask in my presence, to be still and know that I am Lord, Get to care on me, to love on me, to be loved, to be overshadowed, to be undone, to cry. We are weeping heart because God has touched you. To smile because God makes you happy. To hear your mind blown by his wonder and his glory and his presence. I think this is God's message to the church. He's saying, let me overshadow you. Let me come upon you. Let me rest upon you. Time for activity, yes. As a church of God comes together, would we pray, would we seek, and would we position ourselves as we worship together and say, God, we want to be overshadowed by your glory. We want your presence to meet us. When they hear to play games and for personalities to take platforms, we are here for Jesus, the glorified Christ. And watch what happens. Gee, God spoke, God spoke, the Father spoke through the cloud. This was holy ground. He gave an instruction to Jesus, and an affirmation to Jesus, and then an instruction to all who might listen. He said, this is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. And he said to Peter, James, and John, he said to all us here today, listen to him. In the presence of Moses, 
in the presence of the man of the book, in the presence of the man of the spirit, Elijah, the father ushered in a new covenant and said, listen to Jesus. I was at an Elam conference and they had a Elam conference, the summit. He had the pastors together to explain some stuff that's going on with the movement. The teen who had retired minister, and I had, I can't mind his name, so I'm not going to mark up his name, I just simply can't mind his name. I remember what he said, and he, yeah, that's years of experience, many, many years of experience. And the teen I'm out, and, and John Glass says, what would your advice be for every single minister, minister's wives, leadership teams gathered here? And he took this scripture, and he says, my advice to every person is the same advice God gave to every single person through his book on that mountain. And he never used an illustration. He just says, That's my advice is, listen to him. That's the hell life for a minister. The hell life for a Christian is just listen to him. You'll be okay. Listen to him. And that was it. I have never, ever forgotten that two sentences, three sentences of advice. That was about 10, 12 years ago. Listen to him. The Ahangel's Fedawa, listen to him. Why? God says, in the presence of the man of the book, now I'm ushering in a new covenant. Listen to Jesus. In the presence of the spiritual prophet Elisha. Okay, now you've got to listen to him. The book, this book is a wonderful book. The Holy Bible. 66 books that God has inspired through His people. How do you approach this book? You can approach this book in a real and spiritual way. Knowledge puff, puffs up, love builds up. You can approach this book to get theology, to mark you soon wise. I can approach this book as a preacher to, to mark sermons to think that you would maybe like a sermon. You can approach this book in a million different ways, and it's great. To, how do we approach the book? God says, then I just be people of the book. Listen to Him. Well, approach this book. When you open up Genesis, you knock on Genesis' door and say, Jesus, speak. Jesus, speak. You knock on the door of Leviticus. Oh, Leviticus, aren't you glad it's there? <laughs> Numbers. Chronicles are the names. You knock on the door and say, Jesus, would you speak? And then you see in Leviticus that Jesus, as Margaret explained, is the Lamb of God that took away the sin of the world. You only can about that through Leviticus. There's only a foundation for that teaching through Genesis, through the law, that we see that God's requirement, and then John points to Jesus and said, this is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, and you knock on Leviticus, and you say, I want to see Jesus in these pages. You look at the genealogies, and you say, God, I don't understand it, but would you speak somehow through your word? Because God says, look, in the presence of Moses, the man of the book, Listen to Jesus. Look for Him through the book. You didn't understand Ezekiel and ah, the wheels within wheels and the beasts and the four heads and they've all got different manifestations. I don't understand it, but yet the same principle applies. I've got to look for Jesus. I'm listening for Him. You haven't even started on on a spiritual journey at all if you didn't approach this book and say, I need to listen to Jesus. I need to listen to the Holy Spirit. If you put Jesus to one side, you could be a scholar. If you're looking for the interest in Greek names and the Hebrew names so that you can sound smart for a platform and people are going to be oh, you know, your teaching if you approach it like that. He hadn't even started to understand what it is to listen to Jesus when we approach this book, and you can only take my word for it. 
approach it, we ask, Jesus, I want to know you. Moses parted the Red Sea. I want to see Jesus. What does that mean? When Moses parted the Red Sea and walked through. What does that mean pertaining to Jesus? It was deliverance. It was the old is gone, the new is come. It's new creation, lifestyle. Water swallowed up the Egyptians and God's people was set free. Hallelujah. What's that got to do with the gospel of good news? Whoever's chasing you, God, if our enemy is chasing you, if ever is looking to bind you, God can deal with you in the blood of Jesus and He can set His people free. God, Christ, I need to hear your voice. And He said in front of Elijah, the head prophet, spiritual things, listen to Him. Did I just be people of the book, listen to Him? Did I just be spiritual people? And you could come and I could come and lots of spiritual stuff, we're into prophetic words. We're into seeing for heaven is going on in heaven. We're into the moving of the Spirit. But pertaining to all them things, we must see Jesus in them. And Jesus must be glorified. Spiritual minds can be puffed up. Spiritual nuances we live in a spiritual world. But this mighty God says, listen to Him. Did I just be people of the book? Did I just be people of the Spirit? Be people in the book and the Spirit. The Word and the Spirit joined together, but Jesus must speak, and Jesus must be glorified, and Jesus must be magnified. And then He goes on, Verse 7, Jesus came over, uh, verse 6, the disciples were terrified and fell face down on the ground before Peter was really what to build stuff. He was wanting to go out. He was wanting to memorialize this moment. He was wanting to build a tent that Jesus would be under. And Jesus says, no, I'm not coming under your tent. You're going to be overshadowed, boy. And you're going to be far face down on the ground. Then Jesus came over and touched them. Get up, he said, don't be afraid. When they looked up, listen to this. Some uh, verses in the Bible are just obviously worth highlighting. Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, plans to give you hope in the future, plans not to harm you. This is quite obscure, but I just really, 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 really love this verse. And when they looked up, Moses and Elijah, the man of the book, vanished. This is God's purpose for every single person in here. And Elijah, they were gone. It's enough that they appeared. It's not that I've been able to explain in 10 minutes, but I feel why they appeared. But it says they were gone, and they saw only Jesus. That's that, isn't it? God says, I want you to listen to him. Jesus, before that, was speaking about surrender, and he says, some of you are not be able to surrender or die before you see the glory of God. He shows people the glory of God and says, listen to him. Jesus, God says, listen to, listen to Jesus. We've got a picture here. They went out in the Spirit, and it says, Moses and Elijah they disappeared, and they saw, they saw only Jesus. My prayer for you, as you walk this Christian life, that you would listen to Jesus and you would see only Him. Only Him. It's great to get encouragement when people come to church services. My prayer is this, that when you leave, you didn't say, I, I came and, and Margaret was great and Kevin was great and Gilbert led us well and Miriam was like, voice like an angel, and ah, that's what happened, or, or constant heart is for you to come, and if you would leave and say, I heard Jesus, if you would leave and say, I seen Jesus, I heard for him, I seen Jesus, and our prayers is forever answered. It's great to hear gifted people as we come. 
There always a point of the gifting is that you would leave saying, I've seen Jesus. I felt Jesus. I was came and I was bound and I was burdened, but I held something in the heart of Jesus. Honestly, if you come and we do a service and, and you just leave, but you and I since Jesus and you and I held for him, and we and I did our jobs. Because your heart, as I come around the word of God, we is to magnify the name of Jesus. It's to see him in the book. It's to see him in spiritual things. And so if Moses has got to fed Awah, and if Elijah has got to fed Awah, then I've got to fed Awah, and our distraction has got to fed Awah, and our burdens is to fed Awah so that we could see you can finish the sentence. That you would see only Jesus. That you wouldn't see your trials. You wouldn't see your troubles. You wouldn't see the heartache on the news. During this time, it's about hearing Jesus and it's about seeing Jesus. Amen? Would we come to hear Him? Would we come to be overshadowed by Him? Would we come to bask in His presence? And then verse 9, and then I'll tell you the reason that Peter writes about why he thought at this moment. And I'll end on Zacchaeus. You happy with that? You can leave on a time. It's up to you. Your belly's rumbling. The roast is in the oven. But let's go for us. Verse 9, as they went back down the mountain. Isn't it amazing when Jesus said strange things? I don't really got too much to say about this because... Usually when you read the Word of God, it's like, oh, I've got some light here, I need to share it with the congregation. And other times, oh, I'm just not still not sure what he's on about here, but it's still interesting. As they went back down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Isn't that amazing? The guest experience, they're undone by Jesus. Amazing. Shekinah glory goes in the face. Listen to him. Moses and Elijah disappears, they see only Jesus, and then Jesus says, hey, did I tell nobody about this? How could you not tell nobody about that? The first thing I would do at the bottom of that mountain was to testify. You should have seen what I've seen on that mountain. And Jesus says, be quiet until after the Son of Man has been glorified. The only thing I can glean for that, Christ in His wisdom, is better than me. The only thing I'm even guessing at is what, like, when you've had that encounter, when Jesus has overshadowed you by His glory, that you have listened to Jesus in that moment, you have seen only Jesus in that prayer meeting, is that you do not even have to tell anybody that you have experienced that God's light with words will be shining through your body, soul, and spirit. So you will turn up to places and they will realize, hold on, chief, there's something different about you. You don't have to open up your moo and say, look, for, I had a little prayer time and I should kind of go I come. And then oh, Moses and Elijah, they turned up, the man of the book, the man of the spirit. I think fed it away. God says, just listen to Jesus. And I, oh, I just seen Jesus. And I'm coming down this mountain to tell you. I think maybe Jesus was saying, you maybe didn't have to say much if you come under the shadow of my wings. People will can. You know, mind the, the growing up, the ready break man, like you used to, the ready break figure. So you used to, the advert was, you hear ready break in the morning and you went about a day glowing. And people would instantly, they've had ready break in the morning. This is a, use, a bit of a useless gospel illustration. But I'm thinking the same, yes. It's like people will can because your spirit is alive. You radiate the beauty and the glory of God. And even if people are dead in their sins and transgressions, when you walk in a room and you are coming under the shadow of His wings and you're listening to Jesus and you're seeing Jesus, maybe, just maybe, people will sense, hold on, there's something radiating for this guy 
or the Shekinah or lady or the Shekinah holy, graceful. This guy I never seen smile before, and now he never stops smiling. This guy used to be bound and used to walk our hunched hour because he was so bound and he was so lonely and he was so miserable. But suddenly he meets Jesus Christ and he's standing up straight. And before he even speaks, I can tell there's something drastically happened for good for that guy. Maybe Jesus is saying, look, he ain't even going to have to tell anybody about this. People will see it. Second Peter chapter 1. This is what Peter says about the story. Thirty years after the incident, the Holy Spirit encourages Peter, Rem- remember what happened in the mountain? Now write about what happened in the mountain. For we were not making up, this is Peter writing, clever stories when we told you about the powerful coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We saw His majestic splendor with our own eyes when He received honor and glory. Never mentions Moses, never mentions Elijah. He really, it wasn't too much to do with them. It was about Jesus. The voice from the majestic glory of God said to him, this is my dearly loved son. He brings me great joy. We ourselves held that voice from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. Because of that experience, he said, this experience did something within me. Because of that moment, because of an experience, come on, we should be inviting people into experience with Jesus Christ. Because Peter said, I had an experience, and because of that, I'm what I write to God's church and tell them what happened. Because of that experience, we have even greater confidence in the message proclaimed by the prophets. The message proclaimed, the early writers of the Bible, the Bible used to be called the, the book of the prophets. So, he could be saying we have, seen, we have even greater confidence in the Bible. But he says in the message proclaimed by the prophets, you must play, pay close attention to what they wrote. Pay close attention to the Word of God. For their words are like a lamp shining in a dark place. Until the day dawns and Christ the morning star shines in your hearts. Take be careful because of that experience, have great confidence in this word. I know this Bible is true, not because somebody has just told me, but I have encountered the glorified risen Christ, and because I have encountered him, you're not telling me that this Bible is rubbish. You're not telling me that this Bible is irrelevant. And I care for the government says, and I care for what the else says, and I care for non-believers says, and I care for what the else says. Because I have experienced Christ on that mountain, I have great confidence that forever is written in this book is true and is relevant. We should be inviting non-believers, new believers, and an experience of the majestic Savior so that they might read this book and all oh, its stories. Oh, it's, I'm not too sure about us, but I do care in us. And Lennon Ravenhill says a man with an experience will never be at the mercy of a man with an argument. If you've got an experience, you, I'm not denying my experience. You might have an argument, you might have the best, but I have an experience. My experience has led me. I encountered Jesus in 2002 and a rehab while seven stone and counter the Holy Spirit, but baptized in the Holy Spirit, something happened. And because something happened to me, I kind of deny, as I can say, as I met the King, I met the Savior. When I read this book, I can go back to that moment and say, it's true. Every word, it's true. And it doesn't really matter if somebody else says about this book, it's true. There's only one way of salvation I know. It's true because I've experienced God. This isn't a mumbo jumbo to me. It's not a theory. And I made this up. And I consulted the scientists. I have encountered a glorified risen Savior. And I have great confidence that this is true. Great confidence. And he says, You must pay close, close attention to what they wrote. Their words, close attention to your words. Words are like a lamp shining in a dark place. Pay close attention. Keep reading it. You, Om they want a tip on reading the Bible, Peter gives us a, an experience. Read the Bible, pay, cl- pay close attention. Their words are like a lamp shining in a dark place. Pay close attention until the day dawns and Christ, the morning star, shines in your heart. 
He said, I had an experience on the mountain. I know this is true. He said, church, pay close attention to it. Keep reading it until Christ the morning star rises in your heart. You ever felt that? When you read the Word, it's like Christ the morning star has risen in your heart. For everybody's unsure how to read the Bible, keep reading it until Christ the morning star rises in your heart and you know, oh, God is speaking. Oh, God is doing something as sustenance in my life. And that could be knocking on the door of Leviticus, knocking on the door of the Psalms, knocking on the door of Revelation, knocking on the door of Matthew. You just keep reading this book, play close attention to it, experiencing the Lord, and Christ will do something in your heart. We're almost finished. Youth is coming back. That's great. I'm going to end with us. Luke chapter 19, because I've got to prove my words to something in the gospel. So, you ready? You okay for another five minutes? It's okay, youth. You're just while I get the tail end, then we're going to pray. We're speaking about fit comes first, surrender or encounter. Jesus says, some of you will not surrender, some of you will not die unless you encounter. And once you encounter, I tell you something, if somebody's gone ruin and ruin in circles, or they just kind of get victory out of our sin, they need to encl- encounter the glory of Christ. Me shouting at you, you're a sinner. Me shouting at you, your behavior's wrong. Will probably likely who would change nothing about your life. Make Christ a glory. Surrender. It's easier to surrender to a God that is glorified and magnified in your life. Let's look at Zacchaeus, then we'll close. Again, time is ticking along. Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. There was a man named there named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector in the region. He had become very rich. Good for him. Yes, he would have got through the winter, okay? He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree beside the road, for Jesus was going to pass that way. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. The people were displeased. He's gone to to be the guest of a notorious sinner. They grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give, I will give half my wealth. I will give half my wealth to the poor, Lord. I've cheated people of their taxes. If I told them to do that, if I was the word of instruction, Jesus never even mentioned giving to the poor and you've cheated people. I'll give them back four times as much. Jesus responded, salvation has come to this home today. This man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. The son of man came to seek and to save that which was lost. I'm going to ask a worship band to come up. And we're going to pray. Zacchaeus, this little dude, he, he was a cheat before he climbed the tree. He cheated people before he climbed the tree. He never went up to see an instruction. He never went up to get the word He never went up to be spiritual. As this little dude Zacchaeus was, was a little dude wanting to see Jesus. And he was in the crowd. And he said, the only way I can see him, I just want want a glimpse. The only way I can see him is if I climb this tree. He was a keen guy, an inventive guy. So he goes up the tree and he sees Jesus. Jesus sees him. And Jesus notices him and speaks to him. Zacchaeus, I need to meet with you. I want you to encounter with me, Zacchaeus. I've noticed you on the tree. I want to encounter you. I want you to feel my presence. Zacchaeus says, okay, I'll take you to my home. Let's have a party. And then in the presence of Jesus, Zacchaeus surrenders. Jesus doesn't ask him eh? Pharisees doesn't ask him, eh? Jesus surrenders, eh? Zacchaeus surrenders and says, look, I've been out of sync with God's word, I'm a cheat, I'm a sinner, but now I'm saved, and my life's about to change, and if I've cheated Omdi, don't worry about it, I'll give them four times back for I cheated, the law only required double, but grace will always far reach the law. 
If you've got a problem with surrender, it's maybe not another telling you're looking for. But it's maybe not another telling that will work in your life. But it's to be overshadowed by the glorified Savior. To come before Him and say, I'm here. Oh, if we shouted to Zacchaeus, you're a bad man, nothing would have changed. If he'd seen every person that he had mugged out of taxes, oh, nothing would have changed. Oh, but if it did change was when he encountered the glory, the majesty of Jesus, and everything changed. You got Peter on a mountain, he's struggling to surrender. One day people would be healed by his shadow. One day we'd be crucified upside down. And he's writing and saying, look, I have experienced the king. I experienced his majesty. He spoke, he recounts how he's listened to Jesus. He's seen only him. And because of that, he got confidence in his words. Let's stand in his presence. I'm going to really mark us very simple. I'm just going to pray for people that want to be undone. You may be struggling in cycles. You may be teeing your eyes off at Jesus. You may got involved in some things. You maybe just feel dry. You maybe feel weary. I'm glad that you came. Jesus is glad that you came really just going to pray that Christ would overshadow you. We've got to pray for the glory of God to come. His name and His name alone would be glorified. We've got to pray against spiritual deafness so that you would hear Him. We've got to pray against spiritual blindness so that you would see Him. Mayor and everything, we're going to pray for you to encounter the reality of the glorified Jesus. He would sense his presence overshadow you. You maybe came here expecting a new strategy to build stuff and to build missions. And yet God would say, I know I want you to be overshadowed. I want you to sense my glory and my manifest presence. Well, if you would like prayer as we worship, we well, I sing two songs. I'm not wanting tithes and offerings teen up. Yeah, I just want this to be a holy moment. Even if the kids come up, it'll be a holy moment. But if you want prayer, then come forward. We're really going to pray for the glory of God to come. And then, the second song, we'll take up our offerings and give thanks to God for what He has given us. But if you want prayer, you come forward. Let me distract it. Let anything else fade away. Let Moses and Elijah go. Let the preacher go. Let personalities go. Let the denominations go. Jesus, that you would meet us by your manifest presence in this moment distraction would go and the distraction is a devil's playground it would go in Jesus name we ask for your glory cloud to come we put no expectation that anything really looks like pertaining to being found in your glory but we are your people and you said that there would be a difference between God's people and God's people it would be the power of your presence we ask for the sweetness of Christ like an aroma to come and to deliver, to set free, to do your work. But we ask for a magnitude of an encounter with the glory, with the fullness of your presence. Would you walk amongst us as a friend, Jesus?